Pat and Jay Mansbridge here, lead pastors of Bayside Church International, based here on the south coast of South Australia. Our great passion as a church is to help people to know Jesus and to demonstrate His love, truth and life in everything that we do. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Here we go, continuing today with our Heroes series. Let's start with a bit of Bible trivia. Get you thinking. Didn't come to church to think, did you? 66 books in the Bible. The word Bible, the word Biblia, actually means a collection of books. That's why, why we call it a Bible, because it's not just one book. It is 66. It is a collection of scrolls. Every time you pick up your Bible, you're basically picking up a library. Okay? And there's uh, 66 book in, books in here. About 40% of them are named after the predominant author of the book. Okay? So you think of Peter, James and John. At the end of the Bible, in the Old Testament, you've got all the prophets, okay, Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and, and Daniel and Zephaniah and all those guys. Uh, about 20% of them are named after the primary audience that it is written to, and that basically is just Paul's letters. So those named after the audience, so we have the letter to the Corinthians, Romans, okay, <laughs> Ephesians, the Colossians, etc., etc. So that's basically them. Another 20% deal with kind of the primary content of the book. What is this book about? And so we have the book of Leviticus, which is, concerns the things that the Levites did. The book of Genesis, the word Genesis means beginnings or origins, so that sort of describes what the book's about. In the New Testament, we have books that do that, such as the book of Revelation. Okay, it's an apocalypse of Revelation. We have the book of Acts, Acts of the Holy Spirit. Some people say, or Acts of the Apostles, or Acts of the Church, whatever. We kind of have that. And then we have a small group of books in our Bible that are named after the primary character. Not the author, not the audience, but the primary lead character, the lead hero in the story. And so Ezra and Nehemiah. Uh, Ezra might have written those books, we're not too sure, but Nehemiah is certainly the hero of that story. Uh, we have Judges and Joshua. It talks about the main characters of those books. And we have two little books in the Old Testament named after some women. And those two books, named after heroines, are the books of Ruth and Esther. Today, I've chosen a, not a hero, strictly speaking, for the English fans, but a heroine. The good type. Heroine. And, yeah, they are pronounced the same, aren't they? Yeah, forget it. Um, a teenage female, most likely a teenage girl at the time of her story. I want to talk about a girl called Esther, whose name means star. And she was a star. She had two names, we'll find out, because she lived, she had a um, secular name. The, the, she lived in Persia, so she had a Persian name. That's what Esther is. And then she had a Hebrew family background Jewish name, okay, which was Hadassah. Anyway, point, point is, her name means star. And like all stars, she shone brightly on the backdrop of a dark, despairing, devastating, imminent, destructive moment. She shone brightly, and the whole book of Esther is a beautiful story about a heroine who overcame significant adversity in her personal life. A heroine who rose to stardom, so to speak, in a foreign land. God elevated her, a heroine that was willing to risk her life to stand in the gap for those who were oppressed for no fault of their own and a heroine who made the most of the opportunity that it turns out God had given her. And all of this is presented to us in what is probably one of the best written stories of the Bible. The book of Esther is an incredibly well-written story and it's designed to be written well so it's repeated year like much of the bible repeated year after year after year so the jewish people this story would be ingrained in their thinking it would be a story you tell your kids uh, over the dinner table or a bedtime it is beautifully written on the one hand we have an egotistical king who had a penchant for wine women and song penchant and also ran beauty contests so if you can think of a world leader that runs beauty contests and draw your own <laughs> correlations there, we have him. And then we have, alongside of him, an evil, malicious villain 
an anti-Semitic... Okay, this is what you're... Actually, you're supposed to do that, okay? The, the purpose of the book, as I mentioned later, is actually to describe how the Jews came up with a festival called Purim, okay? And Purim today, when the Jewish people celebrate this in February or March, when they read the story of Esther, because that's part of the celebration, they read this book out loud, and the kids, every time they hear the name of Haman, the evil villain, they're supposed to boo, and they rattle rattles and kind of drown out his name. So let's go with that, okay? That's, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. So you've got this villain... And he is a conniving, malicious, scheming, spiteful, hateful villain, just the perfect type of type there. And then on the other hand, you've got these two Hebrew heroes, the two main characters, the king and the villain, and two Hebrew heroes. And you have this beautiful, young, teenage, courageous heroine assisted by her older cousin, Uncle Mordecai, basically, okay? We have the threat of danger. We have the beautiful suspense that builds up in the story. We have comedic irony and satire. You read the story, you will laugh. That's the idea of it. You're supposed to laugh in this comedic story. And then there's poetic justice and a happy ending with a great big slaughter at the end. So, great story for kids. <laughs> and uh, as we find out in the Old Testament, these books kind of go with that. But the book of Esther has it all. So three, thing, three quick things about the book of Esther. Uh, its placement, its uh, purpose, and its uh, peculiarities. Okay. So in the, the whole story of biblical history, uh, you have uh, what Rob was talking about before, about Moses leading God's people into the promised land. Okay. They were known as Israelites, the people of Israel under David in about 1000 BC, pretty well right there. Uh, They become a kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, and then after his son Solomon dies, they are split into two kingdoms. Okay, ooh, that's where all the prophets come in. And one of those kingdoms is called the kingdom of Judah. Okay, these were the men, basically the tribe of Judah and little baby brother Benjamin tucked in there as well. And in that kingdom, that's where David's family rules. And so after, at the end of the Old Testament history, these people become known not as Israelites only, but they specifically become known as men of Judah or Judahites, or another way to say that is Jews. Okay. So in the first part of your Bible, for most of the Bible, you won't hear the word Jew come up. It is only in this part of the Bible where we have the, the Jewish people, okay, the people of Judah, that people. And they are the ones living in Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar comes in, destroys, he's also a great villain, and destroys the city and he carries God's people away to Babylon. And it is away in Babylon, which then gets taken over by the Persians, just to confuse you. It's away there in Babylon, Persia, where a whole group of God's people are in exile. Some of them go back to restore the city in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah, but many of them stay. They stay here in Persia because actually they've got it fairly well okay they're doing quite well why go build another city some of them we're not going to go back to jerusalem so they stay here and this is the period of time where this story is set we're looking at around about 480 years bc which makes it one of the last things to happen before the old and new testament gap okay so it's kind of fits in there when you open your bible to find esther because it's a history book it's in the first half, if you open your Bible to the middle, you'll probably find Psalms, and it's just to the left, because we put the history books on the left-hand side before we get into the prophet books. But that's basically the placement. As I said before, the purpose of the book is basically to describe to the Jewish people how this festival called Purim came about. Okay, so it's designed... You don't know the purpose of the story till you read the last chapter. And at the end, that's when you work out how the purpose of the book is to describe this festival. It's a whole story written in a beautiful way to describe how we, as the Jewish people, have this festival. And one of the peculiarities of the book that's really interesting, it never mentions God. Ten chapters, although you should ignore them when you read it, and I'm going to encourage you, your homework today is what? Read Esther. Esther. It'll take you 15 minutes. Yes, it will. If you just read it straight as a book, forget the chapters are there. Just read it. Like a story, as it should be read, it'll take you about 15 minutes. I did it by the fire last night, and uh, you can do that, okay? Read it in 15 minutes. Just read it straight as a story. And one of the things you'll notice is that God is nowhere mentioned, which is really interesting. Prayer is not mentioned explicitly. Worship is not mentioned No prophets are mentioned. No Moses is quoted. No scripture verses come up. 
Nothing is said about worship. Nothing is said about sacrifices. It is in very a peculiar way a secular story. And many scholars in the past have gone, well, why should we have it in the Bible then? Why should we have it in the Bible? And then people say, well, you know what? It's a beautiful reminder. You are invited to read this story knowing that God is not explicitly mentioned because you're invited to read it, to watch how God works behind the scenes. The story of Esther is a story of the God who, even when I don't see it, is working. Even when I don't feel it, He is working. And he might not be speaking clearly. He may not manifest himself to Esther in a dramatic way like he does to the prophets. But God is working behind the scenes to look after his people. And that is the story of Esther. So let's pray for our hearts today. And uh, we'll go through in typical Chad style. We've got three points. And I know I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm not doing that today. Dad, we open our hearts to you. We thank you for your eternal word that even if you're not mentioned, is designed to reveal something of your nature to us. And so, Holy Spirit, we thank you. You are our teacher today. We submit our hearts to you as best as we know how. We submit our mind and our focus of our attention to you as best we know how, that we would learn from you today. And most importantly, we would be able to draw nearer to you in experience and expression, knowing that we have met you in this book. We thank you and we commit ourselves to you today. And everybody said... Amen. Join me at home. It's great to have you joining us today. If you have a Bible, open up to the book of Esther. As I said, halfway you'll find Psalms, turn left, and you'll find Esther there. As I said before, Esther's basically a story of four main characters. And a few weeks ago when I preached on Noah, I had the felt board and the storyboard out, a Sunday school style. I was very tempted to do that today, but I thought, no, nah, once is enough, once every 10 years. I uh, would we'll probably, probably do that. But the very first character we're introduced to is a guy called Xerxes. And he is the king of Persia. It begins with him throwing a banquet. As I said, he's a bit of a wine, woman and song type of guy. He gets on the grog and in a drunken stupor, he thinks, you know what would be a great idea? Get my hot wife out here and parade her in front of all my friends, okay? All his drunk mates. And so he says, bring the queen here. Make sure she's wearing her best gown. And as a noble woman that she is, uh, she says, not on your life, buddy. You can nick off, all right? I'm not coming and parading my beauty in front of you. I'm no trophy wife, okay? And then his advisors look at this and they go, oh dear. <laughs> King Xerxes, this is terrible, terrible, terrible behavior. And uh, they convince him that she, he should upgrade to a younger model, okay? So basically that's how it does. And so, boo, no, he's not the villain. Okay? <laughs> Believe it, he's not the villain, this guy. And so he thinks, I'll throw a beauty pageant, okay? I'll find the fairest virgin in the land, all that sort of stuff. And it reads like a fairy tale, okay? That's the whole idea. And so he, he gets all these, uh, they, they find the beautiful, vir vir beautiful virgins in the land and uh, bring them to this great uh, beauty pageant to parade themselves, uh, let's just put it that way, uh, before the king. And so we pick up here in uh, Ezekiel, uh, not Ezekiel, what's her name? Esther, chapter 2 and verse 5, where we are introduced to our two Hebrew heroes. One gluttonous king and now two Hebrew heroes introduced to us in chapter 2. Now there was in the citadel of Susa a Jew of the tribe of Benjamin, explained that before, named Mordecai, son of Jair, the son of Shammai, the son of Kish. That sounds familiar. It sh it's meant to remind you of King Saul. Okay, for those of you who know your Bible as well, but we'll look, we'll, you can talk about that over lunch. He had been carried into Persia, into exile from Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, among those taken captive with Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Mordecai had a young cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up. Because she had neither father or mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother had died. The first thing we learn specifically about Hadassah or Esther here is that she was an orphaned child, adopted as it were by her older cousin we discover that Esther was no stranger to tragedy. Her life had not exactly dealt her, if you're happy with these terms, the easiest hand of cards. 
through no fault of her own, Esther's life had got off to a pretty rough start. And if there's one thing that many heroes have in common, it's that their life is often marked by adversity. Their life is often marked by hardship. Their life is often marked by tragedy and suffering of some kind. If you look over your life and you go, you know what, I didn't quite get a good a deal as other people, then you're in very good company indeed. Esther, her life did not get off to a particularly good start, orphaned somewhere as a child. And this is the stories we know of many biblical heroes. Joseph is a great example of this. In fact, this story has a lot of echoes to Joseph, if you read it carefully. Uh, it has echoes to Joseph, who was sold into slavery. You know that? Jeremiah, another great hero of the Old Testament who suffered greatly. And of course, we have the ultimate hero, Jesus, who is the epitome, as it were, of suffering hardship through no fault, as it were, of his own. Heroes' lives are often marked by hardship. We have many famous women whose lives in the modern world have been shaped by hardship. Uh, Marie Curie, Rosa Parks, Helen Keller, Anne Frank, men like Nelson Mandela, men like Stephen Hawking, famous Christian people. We sung a song this morning by a guy called Horatio Stafford. He's the guy that wrote, It is well with my soul, loses his son to a sickness, loses his whole business in the Chicago fire, only to lose his four daughters drowning out at open sea. His, marked, his life was marked with suffering all the way through to modern history where we have a 13-year-old surfer chick called Bethany Hamilton had her life, had her arm bitten off by a shark. That's not a good day. And becomes one of the world's greatest surfers, female surfers. Oprah Winfrey. Grew up, suffered a lot of sexual abuse as a child, no fault of her own. At 14, pregnant, gave birth to a baby boy who died a week or two later. And she becomes one of the, really, one of the only truly self-made billionaires on the planet. Heroism and the life of the heroes are often, not always, but often characterised by people who go through incredible adversity. And what strikes me about this simple statement about Esther is that it is just said as a matter of fact. Boom. You never hear about it again. Esther, whose parents died when she was young. It is said very matter-of-factly. It kind of reminds me of Wesley and Princess Buttercup and Princess Bride where he just says to her very matter-of-factly, life is pain, your highness. Anybody who says differently is selling something. What a great line. Life is pain. And here we go. It just said her mother and father died when she was young. And that's basically the last we hear about. You see, while tragedy may always mark us, it need not define us. Tragedy and suffering may be a part of our story, but it does not have to determine our story and the outcome of our journey. For Esther, she, it simply was. She was an orphan. Yep, that's exactly what it is. It is what it is. My mum and dad died when I was young. And I wonder, you know, it's a bit of speculation here on Chad's part, but whether the lack of detail given to this part of the drama, because this story is all about drama, and this could have been a great opportunity for the author to talk about how her parents died and how she was a poor peasant girl that you know, was, had the risk of being out of it. It could have been a great part of the story and yet it's basically said and left and nothing else is said about it. I wonder whether that says something about Esther who didn't allow or didn't uh, yeah, allow that really to shape and determine her identity for the rest of her life. Certainly we have no sense in the story that she developed a victim mindset, that she was known as Esther the orphan. No, 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 she was known as Esther the great queen, as we'll discover later. And there's no indication that that held her down in her life. That painful experience is a critical piece of her journey, but it's not the defining feature of her life. And one of the first lessons we see in this very subtle Single sentence, which is repeated in this verse. That's often, you'll find that in Esther as well. A lot of things come in pairs. A lot of things are repeated. It's just a literary device. One of the things we learn from her is that heroes will accept adversity and appreciate that the road of a hero is often beset with hardship, but it need not define us. Heroes accept adversity. It's part of the package. Hardship is part of the package, but it need not define us. 
What a somber start to the story. The story goes on, and she's in this beauty pageant. Okay, she has a prolonged beauty regimen of about 12 months, including all these you know, essential oils and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's finally her chance to appear before the king. Um, let's not go into what that might involve, you know, formal gown, swimwear, a speech about pieces, you know, world peace, and all that kind of thing, right? It's basically <laughs> what it looks like, and it all goes well. She comes up, she has her date night, and she's given the rose, and it's all good. Okay, so that's all, that all happens. But amidst all this drama of this beauty pageant and this old bachelor type of scene, two very subtle statements are made about her character. Interesting things. It says in verse 15 of chapter 2, when the turn came for Esther to go to the king, it's her turn, it's her date night, Osha's, you know, Osha's called her, it's your turn, mate. Have a shot, this is your go. When it was her turn to go to the king, she asked for nothing other than what Haggai, the king's eunuch who was in charge of the harem, suggested. The point here is that the women could have taken a gift with them to the king to try to win him over. But she did not do anything unless it was suggested by the eunuch, the one who were in charge of them. Basically, she took Osher's advice. It says in verse 10, a similar verse, Esther also did not reveal, verse 10, had not revealed her nationality and her family background during this year of this competition because Mordecai had forbidden her to do so. It's repeated in verse 20 where it says every day, where it says Esther, sorry, had kept secret her family background and nationality as Mordecai told her to do because she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. Even though she'd now won the competition, she was now crowned queen she still took Mordecai's advice. She followed the advice of Osher, of the, of the guy in the bachelor mansion, and she followed the advice of her cousin Mordecai. And so we see the second piece, a lesson we can learn from Esther here, is that she knew what it was to receive and to take advice of others. Esther was able to acknowledge that some people know better than you. I feel I have a word from the Lord this morning. Some people know better than you. <laughs> I am not getting gendered in this discussion at all. Some people know better than you. And it is a hero heroic thing to take and to accept, to receive and to respond to the advice of people who have been there and who have done that. Those of you who know me have heard me speak before about five different groups of people that God puts in our life that we can learn wisdom from. Five Ps. Parents or parental figures like Mordecai, giving her parental advice. Secondly, God gives us in the Christian community prophetic people, pastors, praying people that can give you spiritual advice that may, they might not otherwise pick up but just because they're spiritual people, praying prophetic people. Third group of people are professionals. Sometimes the best financial advice you get is not from a prophet, but from a financial planner who's trained their whole life in that field. And that was what this, uh, the eunuch is like. He was a professional. He knew what the king liked. Take my advice, chick. I've worked in this industry for a while. If you want the rose, this is what you should do as a professional. Another group of people God gives us to learn from are our peers. Mm -hmm. God puts people in our life, friends and colleagues that walk on a similar journey to us. And the last group of people God puts in our life are pupils because there are certain things that you will only learn when you teach others. There is certain wisdom you will only glean from those who don't know as much as you, you think. And as you are, tr as you are training and teaching other people, you learn. And it's funny, the wisdom that can come out of the innocent mouths of babes, that sometimes many of you have had that experience, God can teach us through, as we teach others, God can give wisdom through those groups of people. And here we see this in Esther. And whether these people are good examples or poor, whether these examples and wisdom comes from dead people or living, God 
It's provided us people from which we can learn and our goal is to lean on them, to glean and to gain wisdom from those who've gone before. And this is a challenge, particularly for teenagers like Esther. Because there's something about the teenage years that makes you think you know everything. Oh, that's a bit quieter than what I thought. <laughs> and so, <laughs> Winston Churchill famously said, when I was 16, I thought my parents knew nothing. When I was 21, I was shocked to discover how much they'd picked up in the last five years. <laughs> Mark Twain said a similar thing. He said, when I was 10, I thought my parents knew everything. When I was 20, I thought they knew nothing. Then at 30, I realized I was right when I was 10. The point is, Esther takes the advice of people that knew better than her, and she wins the rose, she wins the beauty pageant, and all is well. And it is here that we are introduced to the fourth character in our story, the evil, wicked, villainous man called Haman. Oh, Haman. Very well done. Good, good Jewish community here getting on board at the wrong time of the year with this story. Haman, as it turns out, while they're in Persia, remember, in the, in the kingdom of Persia, he's not a Persian by birth. He is actually an Amalekite. And the Amalekites are the classic enemies of God's people right back in the beginning they're the first people when, when Moses comes through the Red Sea da, 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 and, and Miriam's got a tambourine and all that sort of stuff even before they get to Sinai a group of the people attack them now these guys have just come out of slavery right they've just come out and a group of people attack them it's the Amalekites and so all through the scripture the Amalekites there's a bit of this thing about the Amalekites they come from Esau Malcolm and they had like a, a chip on their shoulder from their background with this uh, Israelite group of people and this is where Haman's from okay he's an Amalekite and so there's this ancient ethnic divide here and he's promoted as a high-ranking official with the king the drunk king promotes him basically becomes his second in charge in the kingdom and he thinks it'd be a great idea to make a law where everyone has to bow down to him when he walks through town boo boom okay okay so Haman's getting this treatment everyone's bowing down to him as he walks through town and then he notices one day someone refuses to bow down to him cousin Mordecai Okay, that disgusting, disgusting Jew in Haman's mind. He has this ethnic, anti-Semitic, you know, we get the word Semite, Semitic, by the Noah story. Noah had three sons in the ark. One of them was called Shem. Okay, so the people from the line of Shem become known as Shemites or Semites. So if you ever hear the word Semitic or anti-Semitism, that's where it comes from. Okay, it comes from Noah. So anyway, he's got this anti-Semitic bent about him. He hates this Mordecai and he thinks, you know what? I'm not, I'm not only do I hate Mordecai, I'm going to wipe out his entire race. I'm going to make a law that will literally exterminate, some translations say, like exterminate these pests from our land. And this is the heart of this wicked man, uh, uh, um, Haman, basically, thank you, setting up this great, uh, great this uh, holocaust of death and despair throughout the Jewish people in the Persian Empire. And chapter 3, it says this. Dispatches, chapter 313, dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with a legal order. And that legal order was to destroy, kill, and annihilate. I told you it was a good bedtime story. All the Jews, both young and old, women and children, on a single Blood bath day, the 13th day, the 12th month of Adar, and you might as well plunder their goods while you are at it. And the reason I read this verse, because that date, the reason they came up with that date is because they cast lots. Like, just think about rolling dice. Which date should we have this great slaughter? And they cast lots. And the word for that lots, casting lots, is the word Purim. Okay, so that's why when they celebrate this festival later, it's called Purim. It's the day of, of the lots. The die had been cast. The die had been cast against them. This was now a legal decree 
it was going to be the end of the Jewish people throughout the Persian Empire. The point is, quickly, cousin Mordecai gets word of this, of course. He gets word to Esther, thinks, well, my cousin's in the palace. Maybe she can do something about this and changes the king's mind. Maybe she can get an audience with the king. She suggests, he suggests this to her and word gets back. She says, listen, Uncle Mordecai, great idea, mate, but nobody does that. You are not allowed to approach the king unless you've got an invite. In fact, he hasn't even wanted to see me the last 30 days. I've got no idea what kind of mood he's in. If you approach the king and ask something and he's in a bad mood, it's off with your head. And so she says this in chapter 4. He sent back this answer to her. Don't think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape this holocaust. For if you remain silent at this time, sure, relief and deliverance For the Jews will arise from another place. There was this confidence that God, behind the scenes, not mentioned, (laughs) God would not allow our people to be wiped out. Sure, God will look after us somehow, but there will be implications. You and your father's legacy will perish in this Holocaust. And who knows, the most famous verse in the book, who knows, but that you, my cousin, have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Doesn't explicitly say God has... No, God's not mentioned. But he says, what if, what if serendipitously, what if providentially, what if coincidentally you are in this position for such a time to save your people? Esther then sent a reply, an email back to Mordecai and said, listen, gather all of our people, the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. It's the closest mention we have to prayer. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I, my attendants, will also fast as you do. When this is done, (gasps) I'll go to the king, even though it's against the law, and if I perish, then I perish. Incredible bravery, incredible courage, and this marks a turning point in the story as she asks her community to support her and she makes an approach. And here's the third lesson, three points, that I see in Esther and why she's a heroine to me. Number one, she knew what it was to accept adversity. Number two, she knew what it was to accept advice. And thirdly, she knew what it was to accept responsibility. To accept personal responsibility, to know that I'm uniquely placed to do something about this problem and I'm going to take it on board. Mordecai's claim that if you don't, someone else may. But specifically, if you don't, it will be worse. We'll all be worse off if you don't, if you give in to inaction. A specific responsibility to other people, to extend a duty extended beyond herself to advocate for those who are not in a position to stand up for themselves. The preacher in me was really tempted to have adversity, advice and advocacy. You know, just to be really fancy. I didn't think you'd remember that, so I went with responsibility. Uh, But if you, you know, want to repeat this somewhere and make it your own, uh, then uh, it is adversity advice and advocacy. The point is this, it takes courage to accept responsibility, but that's what heroes do. Heroes take responsibility. Oftentimes recognising responsibility begins with you recognising what bothers you. Because if you hear yourself saying something like, somebody should really do something about that. If you hear yourself saying something like, somebody really needs to tackle that issue. You know, you know the government should really do more about that. You know the, the church should really get off its, you know, and get involved with that. You know the problem with Christians is that we need to see Christians do more and get active and be involved in, well, you know what? Maybe in identifying that problem, as I've said before, if you can see it and you can speak it, Then move beyond that and say, how do I solve it? Because if I see it and I keep speaking it, I might spread another problem without finding a way to solve it and say, maybe identifying this issue is God's way of saying, that's part of your calling, mate. Action it. Action it. 
action. See, we could have had three A's. It's so easy. It's so, oh, what, what was I doing, honestly? I, I, <laughs> Heroes accept responsibility to be problem solvers and solution makers. To say, I'll be part of the solution in this issue. One of the reasons I encourage you before to read Esther without chapters, ignore the chapters, is that often those breaks are really unhelpful. And one of the areas I've discovered one day is in the Gospel of Matthew, between chapter 9 and 10, you know it well, when Jesus says to his disciples, I want you to pray that God would send out workers into the harvest field. And you think, well, I've done my daily reading today. I've finished chapter 9. I'll close the book. The very next sentence says, and so Jesus called his disciples to him, laid hands on them and sent them out. So in one sense, he's saying, I want you to pray that God will send people out. Come here. I'm sending you out. And we can read that and go, oh, God, you should do something about this. And Jesus is saying, come to me. If you see a problem, I'm helping you be part of the solution. Heroes accept responsibility and understand they have a unique role to play. You have a role to play in your family that is unique. You have a role to play in your workplace that is unique. You have a role to play in our community that is unique. You have a role to play in your church that is uniquely positioned for such a time as this. I want to encourage you heroes and heroines to embrace your part of the puzzle with both hands. I'm not going to ruin the story for you. It's a brief summary of how it goes from here. Esther makes her approach to the king, speaks his love language by cooking him a big banquet okay and meanwhile Haman thank you what well is so ticked off with that Jew Mordecai that he constructs a gallow to hang him I'm gonna after the banquet tonight I'm gonna come home I'm gonna kill you okay so he's he's got this uh, anger in him to kill Mordecai and through a great act of coincidence that very night the king has a dream and remembers that some time ago someone saved me from a political coup and I can't remember ever rewarding that person. It's not a dream. He was reading the story, reading the histories. And, uh, and he thinks, who is that man? And it ended up being Mordecai. And so on the very day that Haman was going to kill him, Mordecai is rewarded for something that happened years earlier, right in front of Haman, who is now fuming with anger. And it is the first time in the story that the tables begin to be turned. Them. To make things worse, Esther reveals to the king the genocidal plans of this scheming evil Haman as well as her own ethnicity. She says, listen, I'm one of those Jews. If this law gets carried out on that day where the die was cast, I'm going to be one of the first that needs to be executed. She exposes Haman as the evil mastermind behind the scheme and subsequently the king orders Haman's execution. On the very gallows he had built for Mordecai, the very same one he had built, another table had been turned. With Haman dead, Mordecai is now elevated to his position, takes his place as the highest man in the land. Again, a picture kind of of Joseph, similar thing happening there. He's given a signet ring and all that type of similarity. The king revokes the edict throughout the land. Don't kill the Jews. In fact, I want to give them rights that other people in the empire don't have. The people, the Jewish people all throughout the empire celebrate this. Other people look and go, ah, we should become Jewish too. That sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and so other people in the kingdom go, oh, well, yeah, we're Jewish, you know, get, get the scissors out. And now, so they become... <laughs> bedtime story, bedtime story, I told you. And then the best bit happens. And on the very day where the die had been cast, and God's people were going to be slaughtered. The tables were turned and a whole bunch of Haman's family and others were killed to death. And that's the story we tell our kids at... <laughs> killed to death is probably the best way to put it, I think. And this is the story. becomes known, as, as I said, as a Jewish tradition celebrated today with festivities and gifts and giving to the poor, dressing up costumes and reading of the story. And it ends off with a beautiful epilogue, basically just to say, all is well in the kingdom again. Although God is not mentioned, he's worked behind the scenes to look after his people. Three things I want to encourage you with today. Her willingness to accept adversity meant that she resisted the temptation to develop a victim mindset. And there's one thing I know that really hurts people today. 
It's a victim mindset. A hero accepts adversity. It's part of the package. It is what it is. Her willingness to accept advice meant that she resisted the temptation to embrace pride. Because if there's one thing that I know that really hurts people today, it's a culture of victimhood and a culture of pride. Esther is a hero because she accepted advocacy, action, personal responsibility. I have a role to play to make this world better. And that resisted the temptation to, I guess, deferring that, to abdication of all personal responsibility. Other people should do this. Somebody else. The government should. Somebody, older people should. Younger people should. Men, why should I do this? A man should do this. Abdicating. If there's one thing I know that hurts people today, it's a temptation to abdicate things that are our personal responsibility. Accepting the truth that she was born and she was given the privileges that she was given for such a time as this. Much discussion, as I said, of a history as to whether this book should be included in our Bible. Martin Luther didn't think so, toward the end of his life anyway. But in Esther, as with all stories, even though God is not mentioned, we see glimpses of Christ if you look for them. We see pictures of the nature of God. A teenage girl demonstrates to us what Jesus is like. In Esther... We see a girl who risked it all, willing to give up her life so that she could stand in the gap and save her people from annihilation. In Jesus, we see someone who gave up his royal palace and put his life on the line, literally to death, for the salvation of his people and beyond that, for the salvation of his enemies. Jesus even died for the likes of Haman. Jesus accepted the responsibility for the unique role that only he could play when he gave up his royal position and gave up his life. In Esther, we see someone who accepted advice and in a, in a sense, it was, that's a soft way to put it. She basically followed the will of Mordecai. She did what Mordecai told her to do. She followed the will of her father, father figure. In Jesus, what do we see? A man who followed the will of his father to the letter, to the T, even though it cost him everything. In Esther, we see someone who persevered through adversity, knowing that she grew up in a family environment that was not perfect. In Jesus, we see not an orphan, but we see someone who grew up under not the most perfect family environment or conditions, Grew up with a scorn potentially in his community against him. Born out of wedlock. Serious issue in that culture in that time. But although he endured hardship, Jesus did not identify himself as a victim but accepted the fact that the pathway to heroism is often beset with struggle. And he too was born for such a time as this. So Paul says in Romans 5, you see... At just the right time. While we were still powerless, at just the right time, Christ died for Haman's like you. Christ died for the ungodly. From time to time, someone might die for a righteous person. You might even give your life for a friend. He goes on to say, But God demonstrated his unique kind of love for us in this. Whilst we were still Haman, Christ died for us. What an incredible gospel. What an incredible hero. Read Esther this weekend and see Jesus on the page. I want to ask Malcolm and the team to come. In fact, why don't you stand? Let me just leave you with one Final point of this story. Esther is the heroine 
But as often is the case, and too often is the case, maybe in our life, in our life, God himself is the unsung hero. Not mentioned, not explicit, no major dramatic manifestations. But he is there if you look for him. Where coincidence is actually God incidence. Where quietness and stillness is actually providence. God working behind the scenes. That is the lesson of this book. Showing us a God who at times is not seen. At times is not heard. At times is not felt. At times seems distant or maybe even absent. But it was never left us. Will never forsake us. And is working behind the scenes even if we don't notice it. Our challenge as Christians is to notice and to not let him remain the unsung hero. And even if you get to the end of a day and you think, well, that was a day. That was one of those. See God's hand. See God's hand. Find God's hand and give him thanks because he is there working behind the scenes. Because this I know. Our God works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose and even though this story does not say it explicitly the reason that they are these people are called Jews over and over again is because it's a reminder these are the people that God has chosen these are the people in covenant relationship with God and that's us people in covenant relationship with God people I have a covenant with God that is unbreakable because of Jesus and he is working in my life it would be fitting for us to acknowledge the unsung hero today. Let's not allow him to remain unsung in our life. Can you do that? Just put your hand on your heart and let me pray for you today. Dad, we thank you for this word. We thank you that you truly are ministering to every heart we believe today. We thank you, Lord, that you've spoken, that you are committed to your word, that you continue to reveal yourself, that you continue to reveal the unique role that I have to play as a hero on this planet and I commit myself to live a life where you are never unsung that you are the great testimony the great expression of my life I worship you today Amen I hope you've enjoyed today's message Remember to check us out at baysidechurch.org.au and of course if you're ever in the area please pop in and say good day.